Some friends. This is my name. This is my first name. What does it tell you about me? You were born, born on Sunday. Sunday. You born on Sunday. I was born on Sunday. Uh, yeah. And what else? Uh, you, you're, you're uh, female. You're female. Just yes. the same. Just the same. And then third thing. You're from a car. I'm a car. Yay! I should have brought a gift for you. Yeah! Yeah, I love it. It's a great But who got the other two? Me, I got one too. There's no Usually, Usually, people get female with some effort Sunday, then I always have to work hard to get a can. That was good. Now, what is it about the account that you know? Uh, the largest and most visible group in Ghana. Yeah. 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 What else? 45%. Yeah, 48%. What else? The southern region. The southern region. The southern The most tend to lean towards the NPP. Am I right? Or is it NPP? NPP. Mm-hmm. Although we also fix the NPP every once in a while. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the, the region that's known as the swing vote region, the central region where the fancy are. So if you go to Elmina, Cape Coast Castle, you'll be yeah. in the central region. And those guys will vote who they want to vote. They don't care what you're doing. Right. So we have voted, these are account speakers, they voted NPP and they voted NPP out. Basically, I mean, when the results are coming in, if you see that the, MD, the central region results are leaning towards NDC, you know NDC as well. But there's a huge debate. My husband is a political scientist. And we just yesterday we we're doing this. I get all fired up. <laughs> a debate about what extent ethnicity shapes the voting patterns. Because it's not exactly a mapping on like we think. Right? So it is true that the Ashanti region, for example, will be largely NPP, but there's also a large and so about 16 percent who vote NPC. But in the Volta region, you don't find that same percentage. But because, like somebody said, we are almost the majority, right? Then we tend to carry. But it's not always worked out that what the Ashantis want is what the Ashantis get. <coughs> what else do we know about the Ashantis? They are coming. Are, are two of the languages spoken by the Akan people, Ewe and Tree? No, ever. It's Volta region. Tree. Tree and Fancy. So when you go to the central region, it's Fancy. And then the rest of us speak Tree. And um, so I am Tree speaking. My husband is Fancy speaking. When he speaks, I understand. But I can't produce the words in the same way in which he produces them. He can speak both because his mother is Fancy, his dad is. Um, Ashanti. But we haven't quite done that with our son. So our son can't speak Fanti, he can only speak what I speak. But he can well I discovered this for the day, he can't even understand Fanti well enough. I can. I just can't speak it. But it's fairly interchangeable. There are few there are some words that are completely different, but most of the words are it's just sort of the way they roll their hours. What else? There's one big thing that separates the Akan from not just other ethnic groups in Ghana, but from many other groups around the world. What's that? You get that term? What does that mean? So you in this room are patrilineal. Yeah. I am matrilineal. What does that mean? I carry on your legacy of your mother. I carry on the legacy of my mother. Right? So my father's siblings technically are not my relatives. My relatives are my mother's side of the family. Right. And I have, I don't have a brother, I have a sister. So our kids are considered siblings. 
and the word in Akan is not cousin. The word in Akan is sibling for my kids and my sister's kids. And I treat my sister's kids the way I treat my kids. Right? And so my kids, I mean, <clears throat> two weeks ago, my son had a conversation with me. I said, when we get old, we need a driver because I can't drive the car myself. And then he says, oh, by the time you're old, there will be driverless cars, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, so will you buy me one? Mm -hmm. He says, no, because if I buy one for you, I have to buy one for Auntie if you and I can't afford two of them. <laughs> But that's the way he thinks. He thinks he has two mothers. So what he does for me, he has to do for my my sister. Eleven. Right. And I mean, when you go shopping for clothing for him, we are not even in Ghana. We are traveling. We are buying things, and he's insisting. I have to buy one for his cousin. So if you don't have enough money to buy the same things for all of them. You, you can't buy because he's not going. He will not let you get away. Wow. That sort of now this has fundamental implications for the way we think about who we are, our identity, and how we do things, right? And it shows up in many different forms in the way you conceptualize your relationships, your marriages, right? But also in the way you think of work. And so to have this conversation with you, we have to keep that in mind. You are not going to go to Northern Ghana, it's far. Yeah. The weather will be horrible at this time of the year. Um, but there's a significant difference, not just in sort of vegetation, but just the way we think and do things between the North and the South. Much of what's written about Ghana is written about Southern Ghana and writ large. Right? So you say Ghana, when what you are really talking about is Southern Ghana. <clears throat> and might not look the same as Northern Ghana. And in terms of work, that's one of the issues. So I will be saying Ghana, the statistics I produce will be for all of Ghana. But what it means might not always be a reflection of all of Ghana. A very good example of this distinction is what's the importance of work for women? Right? Um, if you look at the, the literature on development, this is the first time I'm using slides. I, I tend to teach just sort of. But I made the slides, so I have to use the slides. <laughs> <laughs> you can keep for me all. So I have an outline and everything. <laughs> But um, what it means for Southern Ghanaian women in terms of work is that because if I have a sister, right, my kids are as good with me as with my sister. We don't have this problem, which is a problem around the world, about reproductive and productive responsibilities and the ways in which they produce conflicts for women. Two, because we trace through our mother's line, right? Wealth, property, goes through the mother line. And therefore, the mother wants to leave something for her kids. So you have to work. Otherwise, you can't have property <coughs> that you have now. So people will say that typical account statement is nobody will work for your child the way a mother would. And so what that also means is that when you look historically at women and work, thousand Ghanaian women are very visible. We have records from 300 years ago, which we don't have for Northern Ghana. And in fact, in Northern Ghana, when they are doing what we would consider work, they don't talk about it as work. So they would say, I don't work, I make sheer butter. And they don't conceptualize it as work. Whereas a Southern Ghanaian woman wouldn't, wouldn't construct her work in the share butter industry as nothing, as an extension of her domestic responsibility. It's very clear to her this is productive, this is not productive. So a lot of the, um, 
I mean, when, when you are looking at articles on Ghana, I think it's important to keep that in mind. Sometimes you think what you are coming across is conflictual, but what it is is that it represents different parts of, of the country. Now, I am a Khan speaking. A lot of the writing is on the account, so it comes off as if I'm biased. But it's because that's what's written most about. I mean, perhaps the, the, the one ethnic group you knew about before you showed up in Ghana was the Ashanti. Right? Um, and so there's a way in which Ashanti history, culture, practices tends to be dominant. And it's important to keep in mind that it, it's a reflection of a minority in the latter sense of the world. So that's one. The other thing has to do with um, the other thing has to do with this discussion around um, this idea of the role of women in economic development, right? There's um, a famous piece from 1972 by a Danish feminist economist, Esther Busser. And basically, she's the first person who begins to say you have to pay attention to women's work in the developing world. Because prior to that, the argument was that women don't matter if you are thinking about development until a country is at a certain level of development. And if you've studied development theory, nobody talks about who is doing the developing. They just talk about how the development occurs. The assumption is that it will be done by the men. And then when we've opened up industry, so on and so forth, then the women Feature. So women feature in economic development when countries become middle income. If countries are low income, the women are just puffing around. Now, given that in Ghana, women have played a huge role in the public sector, right, for 300 years, this sort of flies in the face of that. Since the 1970s, there's been an attempt to pay closer attention to what are women doing right, in the world of work. And to think of it not just in terms of what they do at home, but also what they do outside the place of work. Um, so when we are thinking about what development is and how women feature, I want you to think about it in that sense in the sense that we are thinking about the private sphere as well as the public. We are thinking in terms of reproductive responsibilities in the private sphere as well as productive responsibilities in the public sphere. Okay. So if you think about what we men do, right, in terms of development, we work, depending on who you are using as your source, they'll talk about your work at home and your work in the public sphere, as well as your communal responsibility. So if you join like um, a religious organization and they do volunteer work, that's also part of your contributions to the world of development. Um, in terms of the reproductive, there's a lot of work about the ways in which, for example, a woman's educational level has an impact on the next generation of workers, right? So globally, your chances of surviving till the age of five as a child is directly linked to your mother's educational level. This is across the globe, no exceptions. The higher your mother's level of education, the higher your chances of surviving up to age five. And once you hit age five, you probably will be okay gets you to age five. It, so if your mother has primary school education and your father has a PhD, you are still equal to the, man, the child both of whose parents have just primary. What makes the difference is what's going on with your mother. Um, so say the, the husband doesn't have uh, that PhD, like you said, um, though he has a higher education and he owns like a lot of property and stuff like that, is it possible for him to give that to the woman, say, because he knows there's lineage between the mother and the child. So is it possible for the husband to give any property, any of the money, if he even stashes it in the 
where it gives it to you. That is something that allows for. But the thing that determines whether you survive is not property. Mm -hmm. It's it's the cultural capital, the yeah. things that your mother knows. So, for example, if if you have a child who is throwing up, right? You go to a restaurant. Or I mean, you are, let's say you have a twenty month old. You go someplace. They are now learning to eat new things. A friend of yours makes something. You try it. The thing looks like they like it. They eat it. Then you get home three hours later and they are throwing up. Right? So they throw up. Most people will clean the child up. Right? They throw up again, you clean the child up. Well, if you have a high level of education, you are thinking they are losing electrolytes. I have to. You have to rehydrate. Right? So I could be living in a very posh house, right? If I text my husband, we need to get the most expensive electrolytes, he'll give it to me. He'll say, go ahead and buy it. Go ahead and take the money, whatever. But I don't know that I need to buy it. So your child will not die because of a lack of money. They will die because of a lack of those sorts of things. Well, this meeting can occur before that because the health of the woman carrying that baby yeah. really matters. And so there's work well done in India, for example, by the Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen that says, so listen to this, likelihood that you are going to have chronic disease age 40 and above is linked to whether or not you were born underweight. Mm -hmm. For your age, for your, you know, so I mean, if you are born premature, that's a different story. But if you are born full term, but your weight is below average for babies, you are more likely to develop chronic diseases as an adult. It's Amata, Zen, and um, can you also write the name of the Danish? Um, Theory. It's then and somebody else, I can't remember the other. And it starts oh, with India. Yeah. Yeah. And then Esther Vosser, it's Esther. Yes. So, what about those who um, don't have mothers, like, you know, like, you know, different you know. situations that have mothers? But they had to have roles that come from their mother. Right. I didn't hear a question about it. What about orphans? It doesn't matter. So you are an orphan. Was were you born underweight or not? No. Right? And then if you are going to be raised, it's who is raising you that matters. He's talking about matrilineal. Yeah, matrilineal. If you're in, 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 in Ghana, we don't have orphans. Yeah. Oh. Somebody take care. Somebody in your family. The idea that you have nobody. Uh, it doesn't exist. Wow. We have orphanages. The kids in the orphanages, they are not orphans. Oh. But some of them even have their biological parents alive. We have constructed the notion of orphans so you guys can give money and feel good about yourself. <laughs> because, listen, right? I've just explained to you my sister's kids are my kids. So when my sister dies, they this is a no-brainer. Yeah, they have another mother. They have another mother. Yes. And in fact, in Ghanaian culture, when your parents die, they give you a replacement. There's actually a ceremony for a replacement. Wow. Oh, no. We wow. no do papa, dear, no do mommy, dear. The person who inherits your mother. Mm. And if, even if me, at my age, if my mom dies, I will get a replacement. Mm. Yeah, and it's usually your mother's sister. Or if you don't have, uh, if all of your mother's sisters are gone, it will be the oldest cousin. What you guys would call a cousin? The oldest female cousin. <coughs> I have a friend, Franca, who her mother died, I think, two, three years ago. Franca was about 47. Now, Franca is the youngest. Her brothers, she has five brothers. There's like an eight year gap between Franca and the last boy. So her brothers are a good decade older. Her mother died age 91. There were no other mothers, mm. right? The cousins are men. So now the only real girl in the family is this Franca who has lost her mother. There was a ceremony. Franca, the youngest girl, was made the mother of her brothers. Mm. Wow. So her brothers now have a mother. It's their younger sister. It's not as if technically Robert is going to be going and crying there. 
right? And she bosses them around. <laughs> like there is a funeral to attend. They are sitting in the US, they don't want to come attend the funeral because they, because they can't remember who it is that night and they won't send any money. She will say, either you show up or you better send money. And they will crumble, but they will send the money. So, in the situation with your friend, it seems as though her brothers gained a, a mother figure, but then she, she doesn't. Yeah. So, how does that work? Like, what what happens in that case? She just goes without a mother, or like she's too much because there was no mother. But hers is a rare situation. Usually, you are being given somebody, so all of you have somebody you refer to. And as I said, I mean, Franca plays the mother role in terms of demanding things from them. Right? In terms of the emotional connection, they have the emotional connection already because they are siblings. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's not as if she called her brother, you say, well, you are the mother and I'm the son. So, mm -hmm. sort of thing. Right? And the, the same thing that happens with matrilineal happens with the patrilineal as well. Mm -hmm. So in the cases of the patrilineal, if, um, if I have a brother and his wife dies, mm -hmm. right, then her, his kids, are my responsibility. The brother and the sister will raise <coughs> the brother's kids, right? And because we also have, um, our cousins are considered as siblings, there's, you are not an only child. You might be an only child of your parents, but unless both parents were only children, you will have siblings. And this is a self-governing action. This is something that the community came up with rather than the government saying this is how it's supposed to be, correct? Oh, yeah. And, that here, right? and this is not something that you can sort of legislate. But what's happening now is that we are taking on the Western conceptions of homeless. So in fact, in the last decade and a half, there have been many orphanages built. And it makes no sense. I mean, I was asked to develop some model for how to how to have orphanages function, and I refused to do it. I didn't want to touch that. Because for me, that's a problem. And you need family in our context. We are not like the states where you can come to Ghana, meet somebody, and decide you are getting married, right? And then you might tell two of the faculty members, they might go with you to the justice or the peace, and you get married. In Ghana, we don't do marriages that way. You have to have your cousins dress up. It's fun. It's exciting. You can't deny us that opportunity, right? And you can't just, they'll say, hey, where, where, where's the rest of you? <laughs> you can't show up trying to marry somebody alone. Where, they'll say, when something happens, what are we going to do? What are, yeah, you need to bring your people. Everybody, how involved are you all in the decision that you made to marry the person? Well, so that's it. So we might not, I mean, my husband, that's what is really interesting. So his cousin got married to this guy we're all not very sure of. <laughs> but what to do, right? We let him go. When he died, my husband refused to go to the funeral. In his words, good riddance. He said, I know it's good riddance, but we can't quite tell her that we are very happy your husband died. <laughs> we have to pretend. <laughs> right? So, I mean, they will say things like, are you sure about this? But ultimately, you sure, go alone. Sure, right? sure. So but the thing is that when trouble comes, we can't just watch you, mm -hmm. right? So if your if your cousin sister is in an abusive relationship, I mean, one of the things I don't have a brother. I have male cousins who function as my brothers, right? And one of the things that happens is your husband knows if he messes with you, he has your brothers to answer to. That's right. I actually know a Nigerian woman who she lives in Abuja. Her brothers live in Lagos. Her husband beat her up. She called her brothers. There were three of them. Two of them got on a flight, showed up at her house, didn't ask to see her, asked to see the husband, beat him up. Beat him up to a pole. Said, next time you want to beat her sister, call us. We will come and you deal with us. <laughs> and Marceline's problems have been resolved. No state, no police, no prison, no law. Yes. The two brothers, 
When they finished, they got back on their flights and went to work. <laughs> I'm not necessarily sure that that's the way to deal with it. <laughs> And we will tell you when you are getting married, there's a whole part of the ceremony where we say, if you go with her and you think she's too much trouble, that's fine. You bring her troublemaker to us. Don't go messing with her. So you can't, if you go alone, nobody's going to say that for you. Right? Somebody, and when you get married, somebody is picked from both sides of the family as the people you tend to if you are having trouble. So we sort of set up um, our own counseling, our own counselors, right? They don't always do the job they are supposed to do, but, but they are there. So you can't get up and suddenly you are getting divorced. The counselors have to know there's a problem that hasn't been resolved. Right? So that when you go back to the family and say, I'm done, you say, this is the issue, it's gone on for this number of years or months, I came to see A, B, and C, he's just sat down there doing nothing, and so I'm out. Or he tried to do A, B, and C, nothing has changed, so I'm out. If uh, someone to come to Ghana and ask for a hand in marriage, do I come to one of the family members that I respect and ask them first or talk to them first? Well, by the time you are getting, I mean, we all know you are an item, right? Okay. <laughs> that you are dating. So we know that this is going to happen. Or it might not happen. But mm -hmm. everyone, I mean, so when I get a call that my cousin is getting married, I know who she's getting married to. You can't just sort of be sitting in the US, you don't call anybody. We have to know, right? So my, even my friends, my close friends from childhood, when they start dating somebody in the US, I know. Because when trouble comes, we are the ones who will help, right? If we have to go and beg and say, well, Aaron is kind of like a fool, but generally, he's okay. And this one thing, he's kind of foolish. Then you call Aaron and say, better not repeat that, otherwise I'm not going to have your back. Right? So we work with them. We are part of the relationship before that official thing. But before that official thing, you have to do what's called a knocking. So a knocking is the official coming to ask, right? And you don't come alone. So that whole thing of going to dinner with your father, no. you have to come with family. Which is why if you if you go and if you, if we dump you in an orphanage, we are creating problems for you. <coughs> Because you can't come and say, eh, my name is uh, Edwin, whatever, and I grew up in an orphanage, so I've come alone. I don't have family. It, it won't compute. Right. Part of how they try to resolve that, at least the, <coughs> the oldest orphanages in this country, is um, the Hermann Minor German Orphanage, started by Germans. And what they did was, you had, you had family. So they'll put, they'll put like six kids together in... So the orphanages have like little houses. And they put the six kids together with what they called a mother. Who lived in the orphanage. And then they would have a surrogate father who lived in the community. Oh, that's <clears throat> Right? So this would be a man who... Thank you. This would be a man who has his spouse and his own kids. But... He comes to that orphanage and plays a fatherly role for those kids. So that 20 years down the line, when one of those six children is getting married, they have an automatic family. The five other kids they grew up in that orphanage with, the woman who was in the orphanage with them. Now that man might have died, but the woman would have siblings, right? And then that man out in the community. Now you can't set up an orphanage like they are doing now. You build a block of flats, you pay some people. And then they are just feeding them and putting them through school and you're all feeling very good about yourselves. Because 30 years from now, I mean, if my son comes with some woman who, I'll be like, we ain't doing this because... <laughs> <laughs> so we are not thinking about the long-term implications of, of what we are doing now. We think we are fixing, right? One of the communities that had, it had the highest cases of um, HIV actually, the, this is a community where the women migrated. 
So our early cases of HIV actually were very location specific, because they migrated to Cote d'Ivoire as commercial sex workers, the, early, the late 70s, early 80s. Those were our first cases of HIV. They had their children, brought their children back to their communities of origin and began to die. So suddenly they had these, they had orphans. They didn't know where their fathers were because they were migrants. What they did was their children were kept in the homes of their siblings, their mother's siblings, right? And then the community pooled resources and looked after them. So the queen mothers um, collected the money a lump sum of money. Then they knew there were 100 kids in these 100 homes. And then that money went towards their education. They didn't put all the 100 in an orphanage to resolve it. And you can, I mean, the woman who writes about this is Atopra. And it's the Krogo, the Krogo case. Right? And this isn't something that you can say is, I guess, is traditional. The government didn't have to tell them to do this. This is how a community resolved its issues. Um, one of the problems, one, <clears throat> one of the problems that we have in the United States is that um, women are some of the most educated and are a large part of the workforce, but don't have equal access to leadership as as much equal access to leadership positions as men in professional industry. So the question I have is in in Ghana, how much access do women have to being um, leaders and owners of companies and government and things in um, the professional industry. So it depends on where, what, on which ones you are talking about. Okay. Right? So I teach at the University of Ghana. In my department, when I first, I started teaching in 2002, there were three women out of about 24 faculty members. Now there are a few, I think there are three, four additional women, right? But at that so I'm a sociologist, I teach the department of sociology. This is a department that has existed since 1948. I'm the second woman to have risen to associate professorship. And actually, in the whole department. In the whole, in the 1940s. So this year will be 70 years in existence. So that tells you you'll be there, but and that's, I mean, <clears throat> at the University of Ghana, the rules said, when you got your pack, right? When you got hired and you got your pack, it said access to, there's a university hospital, which you have access to. But the sentence was, your faculty members, their wives and children. <clears throat> Not spouses. Because when, when the University of Ghana was set up, as was the, in 1948, they weren't thinking women. Right. And so we have to say, in this day and age, you can't be using that sort of language. But I mean, if you, I mean universities are called greedy institutions, right? Because they suck up all of your time. And the institutions haven't really been designed in a way that makes it female friendly. Right? You get your PhD age 28, you start your job, they tell you you've got six years to publish or perish. Right? Those are the same six years you are finding your partners, you are having children. If you are like me, your brain just tends to mush. Your spouse can be very involved in their pregnancy. But their brains won't tend to motion. It will be your brain that tends to motion. So if you are all trying to get the same amount of work produced, it's not exactly the same. But to this day, that's the way the system, nobody's saying, can we make this a little more flexible? So it's sort of when you are able to do it, you've done it in spite of the, of the constraints. And then when others are not able to do it, we say they are not capable. But what we are saying is, well, we are not going to change it. You have to figure out how to let it work. And then in terms of, in terms of politics, like in the United States, it's, in contemporary times, it's more, it's normal for what now, in like the last couple of elections, we've had a woman who is, it's normal for, it's expected for a woman to possibly be a president in the United States in the near future. Is that something that you could see happening in Ghana, where a woman could rise to that level of political power? 
No, but you see, the thing about the, the, what you are thinking of as political power is that it's a Western imposition. And we, it was imposed with all of its problems <clears throat> plop on us. So, for example, we don't have an issue about women's suffrage, right? We never had to discuss women's right to vote. Because by the time we're doing this democracy voting thing, people have figured that one out. So we got democracy where both men and women vote. We didn't have to work that one out. But we didn't get the democracy where men and women are equally being voted for. See the problem? So that's the one we have to sort out. But the amazing thing in Ghana is that traditionally, uh, political structure is complementary. So we don't have one leader, we have a two, male and female. <clears throat> so the, the chiefs, they have their equivalent queen mothers and they rule, they co-rule, right? So you would think when we're doing this sort of Western version, we would, but that's all we did. We have our co-ruling system, traditionally, and then we have the Western system where the women are after. Right? And if you, if you do politics, if you study politics, if you have a system where you have what we call proportional representation, you are much more likely to have women than if you do the first past the post system, which is what Ghana did. So Africa has the highest rates of female leaders in um, political power. Rwanda has 62%. Wow. Rwanda has the highest rates in the world. Okay. Um, and then Ghana has like 13.1%. Because we adopted a first past the post system. First past the post system, women in leadership is a tough thing to get. And it's not just about Ghana, it's globally. So the way to fix it is to fix the version of democracy we adopted. Right? And then the question is, how did we end up with this one? The Francophone countries tend to have the proportional representation. Because that's what the colonial power France has. Then the Anglophone countries went with what the British have, which is the first past the post system, where women tend to be absent. But not to throw you off from your agenda because it's on the agenda, um, you will deal with it in terms of sector because in terms of entrepreneurship, exactly. you are leading in, in terms of women. And, um, Actually, and women globally women. also, yes. Ghanaian women have the highest rate yes. of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Which is globally, yes. and, I think, and I think you can see that if you just go out on the streets, yeah. you, see women, so you see women out. Yeah. It's very visible. Um, one of the issues we have with that data set is that what they, what they meant by entrepreneurship is such a wide yeah. range, yeah. <clears throat> right? That it includes, I have a friend, my friend who I said is now mother to their brothers. She runs a cafe called Kappa Cappuccino. It's one of the five leading cafes in Africa. So Franca is included in entrepreneurship. So is the woman selling the granites, yeah, yeah. right? So it's not, the yeah. and then segmented. But what that data set recognizes and actually allows us to lay claim to is that we've got a very long history of women involved in the world of work, right? So it's, that it, it's, I mean, when the idea of a housewife doesn't make sense in our context. Right? And it's only really elite women <coughs> who are housewives. And even they will have shops that are run by others. So they put their money into a shop. They might not go and sit at the shop, but they have money coming in. They're not just sitting around. Mm. Right. Um, one other way to get at this is to also talk about the difference between the formal and the informal sector. Right? Um, and the world of work in the way in which you think about it, which is, so when you think about work, you think, you get a job, they give you a contract of some sort. You, I mean, in these days of sort of um, working from home and using the internet, you could actually work from home. But for the most part, work meant you went somewhere and did something, and then you came back, then you were paid, right? You couldn't work from home. Um, so a guy called Keith Hart, who came to Ghana in the early 70s. <laughs> he, was an, I mean, he's, he is, he's old now, but he's an anthropologist at um, Cambridge. 
and he came to do his field work in Ghana in a, in a community called Nima, which is in Accra, a suburb of Accra. And he was, bless you, he was very struck by this fact that um, women would tell him they were going to work. And then he would go outside of the house and they would be seated there doing something. And he's like, this is, if you're in your house, it's all work. Okay. But because he saw so much of it, he then began to think perhaps the way we conceptualize work is problematic. It doesn't capture the full range of what happens. So based on that, he developed the term, the informal sector. Now we talk about the informal economy. And it's a huge, I mean, the ILO and so on, all use that term now. But what that captures is, and basically now when we talk about the informal economy, we mean a situation where the relationship between the employee and the employer is not sort of set in stone. And when you work in the formal sector, then it is set in stone. So if you have a job with a contract and the rules and regulations governing your work is stipulated, and when it's violated, there's a place to go to and so on, then we say you work in the formal economy. And when it's the opposite, we say you work in the informal. Okay. So when you go out, for example, so Winfred, for example, Michael Williams has a contract with her, so that becomes formal. But if you go right outside the gate, the women selling there don't work in the, in the formal, they work in the informal. And many of them, are, are, they are self-employed. But the other thing is the informal, the formal economy, access to the formal economy is linked to education. And access to education globally was first provided for men <coughs> before it was provided for women. In fact, in Ghana, the oldest high school, are you guys going to go to Cape Coast? Yes. Yeah. Are you going to go to the Kapum Game Park? No. Okay. We are going to the castle. There's a school in Cape Coast. In fact, when you go to Cape Coast, when you go to Cape Coast Castle, there's a room which now has black pews, right? That's the room where the first school in this country. It was set up for the children born out of the all kinds of funny things that happened between the Europeans and the uh, Mina folk. Alright? And then <coughs> the first high school for girls at the time started out as a primary school, then became a high school. Still exists, it's 180, it was set up in 1836. All right? Wesley Girls, named for Charles. Charles and John Wesley of Methodist, the Methodist um, faith, right? I went to Wesley Girls. I'm very proud of the school I went to, but the fact of the matter is it wasn't set up for girls, per se. It was set up because when the European women would show up with their spouses, they died very quickly of malaria. Right? So after a while, they wanted to have uh, African versions. But these African versions, we didn't know how to make chicken pot pie, we couldn't knit, we couldn't crochet and so on. So they had to set up a school. So it's 180 years old, probably one of the oldest schools on the continent for girls. But it wasn't as if they were being benevolent. Right. And even up until the 1980s when I was in school, we learned how to knit, we learned how to crochet, we learned how to make chicken pot pie. Even though, as you can see, we do not need any knitted or crochet things in this place. But I can make better than you guys. <laughs> you need it. <laughs> okay, so that's that's what and then there were there were so many schools for boys before there were schools for girls. In northern Ghana, the first school in northern Ghana was set up one hundred years, one century after the first school was set up in South Ghana. Mm -hmm. So Northern Ghanaians in general are a full century behind South Ghana. What that means is when we are talking about families, educated families, South Ghanaians have a century, are a century ahead. So there are families of lawyers. Um, I mean, Ghana's first academic was Anton Wilhelm Amu, 
teaching in some college in the Netherlands in I think 17 something. And who obviously have, if you go on, I think even on Amazon, you find the book on them, right? He clearly was not all black. He must have been mixed in with some of the Dutch, right? My husband's family, huh? My husband's mother's family, the last name is Neza. German, Swiss, eventually Amsterdam. My husband's and I kept telling him, way back there, a bunch of slave traders. That's what they were, okay? So they had access to things that my, my family, we didn't have access to. Mm -hmm. And they were provided first for the boys before they were provided for the girls. They were provided for Southern men, Southern Ghanaian men first before they were provided for Southern Ghanaian women, then Northern Ghanaian men before Northern Ghanaian women. So when we are thinking, about women and the world of work in Ghana. Again, we have a problem where Northern Ghanaian women in the formal sector are the latest entry because they didn't get the educations to be able to do it until really since, until independence. That was one of the things Kwame Nkrumah did when he gave independence was to say, we have to bridge the gap between North and South. So one of the first educational plans, scholarships, were for Northern Ghanaians. If you were not in Ghana, you got to go to high school and college for free because they were a clear century behind South in Ghana. And it shows that when we are talking about the world of work as well. And so can you go back to the, uh, you said the year that was made, 17 what? For the high school, the first high school that was made? It was 1836. And I think it's just funny because Morehouse was built until 1867, so it's just funny because HBCU, the oldest HBCU was even founded during that time. Yeah. And so it's, you're actually where ahead of where us. Of, yeah. But your Morehouse, I don't know the story well enough, but I think Morehouse was set up with more noble intentions than Wesley Bell. Yeah, it was, it was in fun. <laughs> <laughs> just a wild guess, right? Well, yeah. I think so because our, ours is started off of, of course, the enslaved people. It was uh, construction was the fact yeah. that uh, during the time, the black people couldn't get an education. Exactly. Um, and ours started at the bottom of uh, Ebony, the church. So ours was Ours also was started, started in a church. We started in the We started at the church. Wesley Girls started at the top of a church. So there's also there's all this discussion about the role of the church in education of minorities around the world. Especially those that are Well, through colonization church was used. For all kinds of things, both good and bad, yeah. Yeah, yeah. education is part of that. Yeah. Yeah. And then there also, there's also the kind of education you get. Right? You can have an education, but it really doesn't mean much, depending on what kind of education you get. And that's like a whole other kind of conversation mm -hmm. yeah. for another day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you guys have thrown me off, eh? That time. Sorry, but it's okay. No, that's you fine. You are learning, right? Yeah. You may not be learning what you're supposed to be learning. Like you're learning. Yeah. Sorry. So, so here in Ghana, um, what are the what are the jobs that um, women are more likely to get? Because you know, I'm in the STEM field, and there, there's a lack of diversity of our gender in the STEM field. So, is that the same thing as going on here? Oh yeah. But but and also what you, so there's also a thing about class, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, so when I say um, Wesley Bell's high school, one, one third of the women in the medical school, one third of the female doctors in this country went to Wesley Bell's. One out of three of the medical female medical doctors in this country went to one school. <coughs> One out of three. Is Wesley Girls only a high school or is it primary to high school? No, it's just high school. It started out as primary then. In high school. Okay. When I was in high school, it was a middle and high school. Because yeah. in those days, we used to merge them. Mm -hmm. Now, primary and middle school are merged, and then high schools are separate. So there's a whole conversation about whether that delivers the same kinds yeah. of things. Because there's something about being 11 and being put in this place where you are told you are better than the boys. Mm -hmm. That when you are put there at 15, by that time, you spent enough time trying to look yeah, cute. It's too late. That's kind of late. And, and so it is a, a private school? No, it's public. It's public. Okay, so, and so it's free. So it's free. And 
So there's a whole discussion because when I went, it was very competitive. You had to be like top of your class to get in. Then there was a whole conversation about how that's elitist. So we should open it up. And then to what extent should we open it up, right? And so on and so forth. Um, Right. And then there were, I mean, there are families where, so the male version of Wesley Girls is in Fanspin. Which actually, incidentally, in our case, the, the high school for girls is older than the high school for boys. <coughs> um, in Fanspin, it's 1877. And Wesley Girls is 1836. Both of them built by the Methodists. And in fact, there are conversations, there are written records of how, at some point when they didn't have enough money, there was a conversation about closing down the boys' school and maintaining the girls' school. So by that point, I think they had begun to take on the girls' project um, in sort of a more noble fashion. Right. Um, so there are sort of people whose fathers went to infant school. Their, their kids will go to either Western girls or infant school. In fact, there are generations of couples where the girls went to Wesley girls and then the boys went to infant school. It's like Spellman and Morehouse sort of thing. <clears throat> and then the children, so that's where the elitism comes from. Right? Because these are 150 years old. Those who are getting to go to these schools are reproducing themselves, if you think in terms of social reproduction. And then it's sort of like, so, I mean, there's a whole conversation now about, all right, I don't have a daughter, I have a son. I pay money into Wesley Girls, right? If my niece is a girl, should she have access to Wesley Girls since my, I don't have a daughter? Legacy. Uh, Where, how far should we draw the legacy lines? Yeah. Given that in our context, children are not just biological, right? <laughs> so, I mean, there are whole kinds of conversations here that are linked into the issues around work and how it works out. But also in terms of who has access, then you find that if you look at the STEM population, everyone's, so there's currently a girl, I think she's 13, she's not 13 or 14, a girl studying math at the university. In fact, it was a huge deal because apparently the university had an age limit. You couldn't come to university until you were 16. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly she had passed, but she was 13. Mm -hmm. And so they had to go and change the law so they could accept her. But then there's a whole conversation about whether you should let a 13 year old go to university with 18 years. They are going to be mean to her. Mm -hmm. Right? Socially. So she will suffer socially, even though she might be brilliant um, academically. And she comes from. I think her dad is a policeman, the mom is a teacher or something. So that's an example of sort of where you wouldn't expect it to happen. But many of the engineers, and there are a fair amount of them, the boys outnumber the girls, for sure. But, and the girls who are in there tend to come from middle income, upper middle income homes. There are exceptions. But sort of coming from a low income Ghanaian household, being female, and wanting to become a medical doctor and actually becoming one. It's like looking for a little mm -hmm. case that sort of thing. It happens, but it's not necessarily the easiest thing. There's um, Ashesi University. Ashesi University has a sort of, um, what would you guys call it? What do you call the programs that you set up for? Well, it's like a first generation program. First generation for girls, right? And they have scholarships. Um, <clears throat> even MasterCard Foundation, the card company, puts money into that scholarship and so on. And then the conversation is always about, I mean, you feel like a fish out of water. Hmm. Big time. Right? Because these kids who are going to Ashesi come from across the continent. They come from fairly wealthy homes. They travel, they know all kinds of things, and then they pick you from this village and they've paid all of your fees and they put you in there. Now you might be doing well in class, but you probably hate it when classes are over. Because you go back home to the dorms and what they are talking about, you have no food. You don't own a tablet. Nobody in your family owns a tablet. Right? They are talking shows on satellite television. You don't have access to satellite television. 
they've been all over the world, you have it. They are talking about the foods they like, the lasagnas and the pizzas and the ugalis and stuff, and you have no clue what that is. Your clothes probably don't look like you know, live in the 21st century sort of thing. Like you don't know. You know we have the African prince and the young men are always doing fancy things. That costs a lot of money and you don't have any of that. And I'm not necessarily sure that we are doing... I think we are giving them access so you can be there. But the social components of it, right, I'm not sure we are capturing. We are capturing all well enough. So we are sort of fully conscious of the kinds of questions you are asking and trying to do something about it. I'm not so sure that the solutions we've come up with are the smartest um, solutions. Okay? Okay, can we now do what I came here to do? Yes. How much time do I have? Whatever you need. Okay. <laughs> Whatever I need. Okay. Here, all day. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's let's skip this. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to take different sectors of the economy, right? And sort of walk you through where men and women are located. So we sort of done some of it for the um, formal sector, but I was going to take you through based on where the numbers are. So. We have to start not with the formal sector. In Ghana, only maybe now 15% of the population work in the formal sector. Most of us will work in the informal, so that's where I focus. Um, and I start with agriculture. The thing with agriculture is that, unlike the rest of the world, on the African continent, women have been part of agriculture for as long as we have statistics for. So I just picked one from 1928. This was a guy called Herbert Bowman. He looked at 213 ethnic groups. So he didn't look at countries, huh? Because 1928, he didn't have countries. He looked at the ethnic groups. And he found that in 11%, only men went on the farms. In 34% of the societies, only women did. And then in 55%, both men and women went the fields. But what they did would be different. So in some societies, what they grew would be different. In others, how they work the land would be different. So in a place like Ghana, for example, women don't clear virgin land. So if we had a plot of land that had never been farmed before, and we wanted it farmed, the men would clear the land. Then after that, both men and women would be seen on the farm. So, so it's what segment of farming activity is being done. Different. In other places, it's the implements they use that are different. In the Ghanaian case, um, a large proportion of the women work in agriculture. And we are very visible in terms of both growing and processing food crops. So if you eat a meal in Ghana, half of that meal, or half of the time that you eat in Ghana, what you eat would have been grown by women. Right. And we don't, when it's the food crops, there isn't a, a segmentation. Food crops, men and women grow food crops. Where you find the difference is in the cash crop industry. Mm. <laughs> Cocoa, oil palm, increasingly all these large scale land acquisitions of different sorts. I'm just going to do a quick history using the case of cocoa to sort of give you a sense of how it is that although women are heavily present in the food crop industry, they are absent in the cash crop industry. I'll use the example of cocoa, but there are many versions of this story that could be told, so long as it's a cash crop. So cocoa, Ghana is the world's well, second um, eating producer of cocoa. We alternate with Cote d'Ivoire. Okay? Um, Ghana's cocoa came to us via a guy called Tete Kwashi. You've been here two days. Do you know where the Accra Mall is? Yes. Okay. Across from the hotel. Yeah. Across from African region. Have you seen that Lego building? You know the Lego building? They're building the yellow, brown, yes. white. Yes. Okay. Right across from that is the mall. Before the mall was built, there was what was known as the largest circle in the world. And it was named for Tete Kwashi. Who, as the story goes, 
actually went for the British. So he went in the house of the. Basically, he was what we would call a. The word we use is house boy. I'm not sure if yeah. I'm saying. You know what I mean? So he went in the household of the British. Right? And the guy was going to Boake. It's now Boake. At the time, it was Fernando Po. Fernando Po is an island off of the coast of Cameroon. Sao Tome, Principe, the fourth, Fernando Po, the fourth one, right? So, Tete Kwashi went with him. On that island, they grew a lot of cocoa. So, Tete Kwashi got used to cocoa, cocoa products, and so on. When they were coming back to Ghana, he stole some of the cocoa pots and brought them back. He brought them back, really, to be able to consume it with his family. He wasn't planning to turn this into a money making venture. Okay. But when he got back, the British guy they had gone with, you know, colonialism. They brought the best, the brightest and the best, right, from Oxford, Cambridge. You'd be about 22 years old, 23 years old. They'll send you to the colony as a colonial officer. Your job is to extract as much money as you can from the population and repatriate it. If you are good at that, the queen gives you, you might even get knighted as a whatever. So we are trying to figure out how can I make as much money as possible from these people. So one of the ways we try to do it is through taxation. Yeah. But you, people have to have taxable things to tax. And so the taxation thing was proving quite difficult. And there's a lot of writing, not just pretty much along the African, across the continent, about the riots around taxation. One of the more famous ones is known as the about Women's. I might need to write this. So the, the woman is Judith Van Allen. Yeah. And she writes about the about Women's War. It's an old piece from like the 1970s. But it's basically the story of how so the colonial officer calls the men, right? This is an, a community where they don't do meetings for just men. They do meetings for both men and women. They call their meetings, their community meetings, Mikiris. So they hold their Mikiris when they have issues and they deal with it. This colonial governor officer has no clue about this, so he just goes and calls the men, because he's working with Victorian mentality, right? calls the men and tells them that a tax is due. He's coming to collect his taxes, gives them a time period. The men go home and try and tell the women that taxes are due. The women ask, taxes from whom? Because we went at the meeting. So we hope you didn't go and say we are paying taxes when we were not there. If you want your sanity at home, you say, oh no, I didn't say you were supposed to pay. Meanwhile, that's what you said, but you are figuring, at least let me give myself you know, some breaks here. So when the colonial officer shows up, the women are not amused at all. And they refuse to pay. And they destroy property in their annoyance, right? But that's just one of many examples of how this taxation project was proving very difficult. So in that kind of environment, COCO is a smart move, right? Because what you do is now you, the colonial government, you are going to supervise the production of the cocoa on mass, right? Then, if they are producing the cocoa, when it is time for the taxes, they will have something to tax, the cocoa farms. They will sell the cocoa produce to you, the government, right? And because they are going to get money from it, they will not cheat, they will bring all the cocoa produce to you. You will then calculate how much they are supposed to be paid. You will take out your tax and you pay them the difference. So suddenly, what had been brought in here for personal consumption became something that the state, the colonial state, took over. But the colonial state took over it with its male conceptions of how agriculture works. So those who were provided with the support for growing the cocoa were men and not women. And so if you look at early records, 
in some communities, only 3% of the cocoa is being grown by women. And the women began to grow the cocoa later than the men did. And they also grew the cocoa on smaller farms than the men, than the men did. Right? And in spite of all the attempts to sort of fix that, we still only have 25% of the cocoa farmers today being female. And if you look at the statistics, what you see is that the cocoa farmers who are female tend to be older than the cocoa farmers who are men, and tend also to be widowed. And what that is suggesting is that they are inheriting the cocoa farms, not sort of starting off the cocoa farms. Um, you can, I, I can tell you a similar story with things like oil palm. In the case of oil palm, it's not the colonial government. It's multinational companies like Unilever, those who make um, palm oil, jab, those that guys, that so. They've created, so in the oil palm industry, in cocoa it's 25% women. In the oil palm industry, it's 16% women. But remember in the food crop industry, it's half. So you see that if you look at the statistics, women are invisible in the export sector. But it doesn't mean women don't do agri. It's that the kind of agri they do, thanks to the policies of both the state and private sector, tends to shut out the, the women. Okay. Um, we've sort of talked about industry. Okay, so I've told you, we've done this, right? So let's do the next one. Um, manufacturing. So here, the point is that this is where women actually are most visible. And this is, in a sense, where we've been present for a long time. If you take the agriculture and you take the manufacturing, these will be the two areas where we are most visible. We are visible in the, uh, in the garment, textiles, garments, more the clothing industry. Right, um, and in fact, now you can go online and there are all these really high end female designers as well. But this idea about making clothes, it's and it's a large industry that this supports. We these days there are ready to wear pieces of clothing, but for the most part, you made your own clothing, you and the dressmaker decided what you wanted and designed it and so on. So there's a large industry around that. And as I said, when we do rites of passage, it comes with specific kinds of clothing. So if there's a wedding, right, then there'll be specific clothing that gets made for the wedding. When you have a child, that's what we call a naming ceremony, and there's specific clothing for the naming ceremony. When you've had a child, you are supposed to, your wardrobe is supposed to reflect the fact that you're a new mother. So your whole wardrobe would change to reflect that. There are um, specific clothing made for funerals. Increasingly, we do specific clothing for 80th birthday parties, 40th birthday parties, 50th birthday parties. So there's a whole industry that's generated around that. Um, then there's the food and uh, food processing. Uh, going to Cape Coast, you might well if you look in the in the fishing villages, for example, you see fish processing, right? So converting the fish into something that lasts longer than being fresh fish, we do it with cassava. Have you had red red rice and plantain and beans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. red red the first night. So when you do red red, you're supposed to add gari to the beans. Mm. Gary is processed cassava. Right. So that's how we, because fresh cassava doesn't last long. Process lasts longer. That's a large, long um, history. I just wanted to say you mentioned naming ceremonies. I had a naming ceremony. You did? Good for you. My son didn't have a naming ceremony. We were broke. Well, we went broke. Well, I said we were broke, but it was more so that we went here. So we got away oh, with, not, with not doing it. Yeah. 
that that's probably one of the nicest ceremonies to be a part of. This we still maintain. So we process fish, we process gari, we process oil palm, and so on. Right? And there's a long history of that. What you don't find us in is in factories. And if you if you do um, if you take a class on women at work globally, and you look at women in the developing world, where they tend to feature is in manufacturing, right? So um, the Maquiladora story across the globe. In Ghana, that's not worked out very well. And I do work in this area. The summary argument is. Macladores thrive on the assumption that women don't have options. So, as Paul Krugman will say, a bad job is better than no job at all. Right? In our context, we don't think so. There are bad jobs. And Macladores are bad jobs. Period. So you find that people will join the factory and very quickly quit it. Because they will say things like, all right, so the reason why I joined the factory is not because I don't make money, it's that I don't make consistent income. What we call security of tenure, right? Because if you sow for a living, you can't tell the person to give you the money upfront. Nobody will do that. You have to sow first. And when I come for it, I pay you, right? Around Christmas, one of the things that most women will get will be lots of fabric. So you get lots of fabric. I probably now have 12 different pieces lying in my house that I got over Christmas break, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll carry them all to my dressmaker, Millicent, and say, let's make all of this. But Millicent won't see me till about June, because I already have clothes. So I'm only going to go to Millicent when I have spare money to pick up my clothes. She can't call me to say, come and get, hey, I don't have money to come and collect it. So Millicent can't count, when I take her 12 pieces next week, she can't count on the money from the 12 pieces as her income for the end of the month. Because I'm not going to necessarily come at the end of the month. Right? If my cousin is getting married, though, when I take the fabric, you know I'll come for it. Because I need it for the wedding. But other than rights of passage, you can't really count on us showing up. So some months you make a lot of money, some months you don't. If you work in a factory, every month you make a certain amount. You can sort of plan your life around that. So that's a major incentive these women have for showing up in their factories. But they quickly discover that how much they make and their constraints for working in the factory doesn't make any sense. Right? If you work for yourself, you can sew whenever you like. You can sew in the middle of the night if you have insomnia. Right? You can decide tomorrow I'm not sewing because a friend of mine is going to do surgery and I want to go and be with her in the hospital. You don't need to ask permission from anyone. When you are sewing, you can decide to stop at 11 and have lunch. Nobody's going to say it's not time for break yet. Right? So you've got flexibility. The other thing that happens in Ghana, it's not about the traffic. If you work, you have to like leave early to go and you get back home late. And you spend at least two hours of your day sitting in a car trying to get to work. Right? Two hours of your day which you have to yourself if you work for yourself. So you will do that if what you get at the end of the month far outweighs what you get on average from these people who bring you fabrics and don't come back to pick up. And what they discover once they start to work is that that's not how it works. So they say, I'd rather stay home, get paid for five of the pieces of fabric and have my time to myself mm -hmm. than work in this factory and get paid the same amount of money and not have my time myself. So you don't see, um, I put AGOA there as, um, AGOA re refers to the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which was passed in June 2000 by Bill Clinton. There are variations of this, I think they are not AGOA 5 or whatever. And it was supposed to convert us into manufacturing, and it hasn't quite happened, because the logic doesn't jive with our reality on the ground. So that's a quick one of that. And then the services sector, this is what you see when you go on the streets. Right? Um, 
and in fact the wholesale and retail trade is per perhaps the largest one. People say that Southern Ghanaian women have an itch to buy and sell. That is, my younger sister is a pathologist, like an autopsy pathologist. Sometimes she decides she's not going to work, so she takes a day off from work. She has a friend who sells shoes. And my sister will go and buy the shoes from her friend. When her friend, so her friend travels to Italy and buys the shoes in 40 foot containers. When she comes back, if you will take a day off of work, she goes into her bank account, pulls 5,000, 8,000, whatever she feels like. She buys it from Grace, Wednesday evening. She takes off tomorrow. She goes to sit at the, there's a banking school. Also, the, the women who work in the banks, they like to wear these heels, right? So she goes, and it's a car boot sale. She opens her boots, and she sells the stuff, and she makes whatever profit she wants to make one day. Then the next day, she goes back to the hospital <laughs> and continues as a pathologist. <laughs> right? And, so, and there are many faculty members who have a whole thing on the side selling. Right, but it's very top endemic, and this is the area for which we have the largest, the longest history. So there are records from like the 1700s of Ghanaian women trading. There are records for the same for Senegal, the same for Nigeria as well. So we say West African women have had a very long history of trading than the men. Um, now when you look at the trading sector, there are, it's segmented. So things, you not know, quite where it's right, microwaves, kitchen stuff, and those kinds of things. Electronics tend to be sold by men. Um, Non-kitchen stuff tend to be sold by women. Automobile parts tend to be sold by men. Sort of thing. Right. But, I mean, the, the trade sector is probably where women are most visible. And then there's a huge range from low income to women who have hotels. In fact, in this East Legon area where you are staying, a fair number of the houses that you are seeing are built with trade money. There are women with houses in the UK built with trade money. I know a woman, Jennifer Bafue, who has a degree from IDS, Institute for Development Studies. It's considered, it's number two in the world for development studies. Jennifer's mother paid for her to go and do the degree. She came back with her master's, was working at Action Aid as the agenda officer, or whatever. And then one day her mother said to her, you, how much do they pay you over there? I'll double it. So Jennifer has a master's degree from IDS. As we speak, she's sitting in Bacola Market, she trades sugar. Her mother is the largest trader of sugar in the country. And the mother wants a succession management planning, right? She needs to ensure that when she's not around, the business survives. So she calculated her pension and whatever and said, I'll double it. So there's, I mean, the, the point is that there's a very wide range of that, the, the trading sector. Okay? Um, then what else? I think the final bit of it, the one was like, in the final bit of it, I tried to link back to a conversation we were having earlier about um, women in leadership and so on and so forth to talk about ways in which, if you are thinking in terms of the development of the country, some of the ways in which women feature. It's not directly in terms of what they themselves are doing, but it's in terms of how they determine what others do. So I use the case of queen mothers. One of the roles of queen mothers is to be what we call king makers. Right, so the, the king is chosen by the queen mother. And therefore, you can either dump a lousy king on us, or you can dump a decent king on us. And depending on who you make the king, you can really shape what happens with the country. So I'll just give you two quick examples. The current king of Ashanti, when he was made, he was made king in, I think, in the 
the US at the time. It's either 1999 or 2000. I think it was 1999. <coughs> and it was a huge deal because the rest of the of Ghanaians didn't think he deserved to be king. And the queen mother at that time was his mother, so we thought this was just nepotism, right? You shouldn't pick your son. And if you are going to pick your son, he better be deserving of it. And it didn't quite look like he was deserving of it because he was coming. The king who had died before him was an Oxford trained lawyer who ran his famous chambers in Kumasi before he became king, right? This guy couldn't get his accounting degree sorted. He was like, he was what we call hustling in London. Right? So we're like, how do we go from well-trained, famous lawyer to hustler on the streets of London? But he's probably one of the best kings. It may have been because he felt, I better prove myself. Right? But whatever it is, he's done some really interesting things with the Ashanti community, including we now have an educational trust fund for Ashantis. And the monies are paid in globally. And, uh, and then there's a board of directors who oversee the disbursement of the monies and so on. And so on. <coughs> or the Ochihne who has violated some of the rules around chieftaincy to make a point. So one of the things about chiefs is that you know what, if you have a leader, you're supposed to show bravery, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the rules among the Akan is that you shouldn't see a chief running. Because if a chief is running, it means there is danger, and instead of facing it head on, the guy is like disappearing on you. Right? So really, uh, you, can, you are not supposed to see a chief, so he can't go jogging. <laughs> I mean, when they made the rule, I don't think jogging as a concept existed. But we don't care. The point is, you should not see the guy like looking like he's in flight. <laughs> but what he decided to do at some point to tackle the issues of HIV AIDS was that on World AIDS Day, which I think is 1st December, he would do a run with his council of elders. So he would say, I am running because this is an issue, this is danger, and you should pay attention. So they've done some interesting things that have had fundamental, I mean, so now people take the HIV AIDS thing serious because they are chicken brands <laughs> around that and so on. Okay. So just to, because what I wanted to do with this was to show you the ways in which our traditional lives also have something to do with quote unquote what happens in the morning. Okay, so I, I think we're done, right? Yeah. Are there any final questions? Yes. 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 Yes.